I'm Mason. As I work now, I think to myself. I ponder how truly happy it is to see a family together, all smiles. I was raised by a single mother, it was just the two of us. I've heard that my parents divorced when I was one year old. My mother worked while leaving me at daycare, but once I started elementary school, she began working from morning until late at night. I can understand now that we were quite poor back then. For breakfast, it was usually cereal, snack bread until mom came home, and at night, we often had a pasta with tomato sauce. The occasional fried egg that came with it was a treat. Meats like steak were really occasional, but every meal my mother cooked was delicious. Even though she would come home late, around 10 p.m., I was always home alone until then. It's unthinkable now, but that was just the everyday norm back then. I still remember my mom's apologetic face saying, I'm sorry we can't be together more. I always played alone. I was going back and forth between the parking lot of my apartment building, the grassy area next to it, and a small park a little further down the street. My clothes were a worn out t-shirt. Maybe because I looked timid and was quiet, I didn't make friends. But I think it was good that I didn't have any friends. I couldn't have played like everyone else. After school, everyone would often gather at the local Kenny store, buy snacks and drinks, and then eat them at the park. I had no allowance to buy such things. I could not have joined a group anyway. There were times I felt lonely. But as a child, I understood it was just the way things were. Being alone was normal for me, but as I got a bit older in elementary school, my world expanded and I had a special encounter. Walking down one of the back alleys from my house, I saw a dog with a beaming smile in the yard of the house, wagging its tail at me. How cute. I muttered to myself, stopping in my tracks. As I kept watching, the dog wagged its tail even more and started barking excitedly. Then, I noticed a lady, about my mom's age, sitting nearby, whom I hadn't seen before. When she noticed me standing there, she asked, Oh, who do we have here? I was surprised to see someone there and found myself at a loss for words. Then the lady said, It seems Buddy is happy to see you, want to come over. Wanting to get closer to the dog, I nodded yes. The lady then said, Come on in. Buddy is gentle, he won't bite, he loves being petted. She told me with a smile as I cautiously approached the dog. I tentatively reached out to pet the dog. As I did, the dog sat down, wagging its tail, and seemed delighted to be petted. Then the dog sat down, wagging its tail excitedly as I petted it. From that day on, I started visiting Buddy. On days when the lady wasn't gardening, I somehow felt I shouldn't go into the yard, so I just waved at Buddy and went back. Buddy always barked happily when he saw me, letting me pet him as much as I wanted. I loved that gentle Buddy. You're kind to animals, aren't you? Buddy always looks so happy when you come. The lady told me, making me smile. As I was petting Buddy, the lady exclaimed, Oh, I bought something new today, and rushed inside the house. She came back with something in a plastic bag and asked, Mason, do you want to give Buddy a treat? I nodded, took the treat from her, and gave it to Buddy. Lucky you, Buddy, getting treats. When I was in daycare, I missed snack time. I said to Buddy as he happily minched on his treat. I was just voicing my thoughts at the time. But now I understand. Perhaps the lady sensed something then. That's it. I'm good at baking cookies. I'm planning to make some tomorrow. So if you'd like, come over, Mason. Let's eat them with Buddy. She offered. The next day, eager with anticipation, I ran to the lady's house as soon as school ended. I've been waiting for you. I was greeted by the smiling faces of the lady and Buddy. On a small table in the garden, there were lots of cookies in different shapes. Here, these are your cookies, Mason. 
she said, and Buddy whimpered, looking eager. Oh, Buddy's treats are over here. Let's all eat together. The lady had also prepared homemade apple juice. They look so yummy, thank you. At the moment I tried a star-shaped cookie, a wave of sweetness flooded my mouth. This is delicious. It's the first time I've had such tasty cookies, I exclaimed cheerfully. The lady smiled, saying, I'm glad you like them, but tears were streaming down her face. Surprised, I asked, what's wrong, but she just shook her head, wiping her tears. A bit later, the lady said, I'm sorry for crying, and explained why she had been crying. She once had a child who had passed away as a baby. If the child had been alive, he would have been about my age. Just thinking about it made her cry, she explained. There's been a lot of sadness in your life, too. I managed to say. I've had my share of sadness, too, but I want to live happily with my mom someday. I'll grow up fast and work to support her because she's working so hard right now. I want to earn a lot of money when I got a job. I'm wondering how I can do that. I found myself saying what I was thinking, probably because she told me what was on her mind. Despite my sudden outburst, the lady seriously considered my question. Well, until you grow up, the best thing you can do is study hard. By doing that, when you get older, you'll have a lot of job options to choose from. From there, you can find a job that pays well. Ah, but remember, it's important to find a job you love. That's crucial. She advised. From that day on, I worked hard at my studies. When I faced a difficult problem at homework, the lady always helped me. I would peek into her garden every day, and if she was there, I'd drop by. For me, who had no friends, spending time with a lady and buddy was a great joy, but that warm time didn't last forever. One night, while studying at home and waiting for my mom, the phone rang. The calls I usually get at night are only from my mom saying, I'm on my way home, but that day, the call came earlier than usual. Curious, I answered the phone. It was from a woman I didn't know. After confirming my name, she said, stay home, I'll be there soon, and hung up before I could reply. Soon after, the woman from the call arrived. She worked with my mom. But what she said next left me in disbelief. Your mom has collapsed. Let's go to the hospital together. With that woman, I headed to the hospital. Arriving at the hospital and sitting on a long bench in the waiting area, a doctor came out of the treatment room. Where's mom? When I asked, the doctor squatted down to make eye contact and said, It seems your mom has collapsed from exhaustion. She must have worked very hard. So, let's let her rest quietly for now. That's what he said. He didn't say it in so many words, but I somehow understood what it meant at that moment. My mother had passed away from overwork. After that, I was taken by strangers and put into temporary care. A few days later, people claiming to be my grandparents appeared. They were strangers to me because I had never met them before. I don't know how they were contacted, but it seemed there had been some estrangement between them and my mom. We are your mom's parents. Let's live together at our place from now on. The person claiming to be my grandfather said this with a bright smile. Though I was scared to suddenly live with strangers, I, who understood nothing, could only nod in agreement. After my mother's funeral, the day to move came. My grandparents and I were moving boxes into the car. It's time to say goodbye to this place. That's when I suddenly remembered the lady and buddy. I have to say goodbye properly. Grandpa, please wait, just a moment. I ran as fast as I could to the lady's house, gasping for breath. Hello, I'm here. I shouted as loudly as I ever had. The lady was inside but came out in a hurry when she heard my shouting. I told her about my mother's passing and that I had to go live with my grandparents now. Take care. Crying, I petted Buddy's head one last time. 
but he licked my tears, and the lady cried with me. The lady kept rubbing my back, repeating, stay strong, be well, over and over. After saying goodbye to the lady and buddy, I went to live with my grandparents. The journey to my grandparents' house felt incredibly long, but it was actually about an hour's drive from where we had lived. From then on, I lived with my grandparents, who were incredibly kind, and never once did I see them angry. They bought me toys and games, ensuring I lived a life without want. However, the shock of losing my mother and the difficulty in adjusting to a new school made me withdraw for a while. I spent most of my time shut in my room, but one day, my grandmother brought me cookies in a box that she had received from a neighbor. Eating the cookies with my grandmother reminded me of the cookies the lady used to bake. Can I make cookies too? With that thought, I used my allowance from my grandmother to buy cookie ingredients. From that day, I began baking sweets. My grandparents were relieved to see me enjoying baking and let me do as I wished. I progressed through middle and high school and then went on to vocational school. My grandparents were always there to support me. Fully aware that my education wasn't free, I studied hard and graduated top of my class from vocational school. After graduation, I started working at a cake shop, gaining experience as a pastry chef. After working for several years, my grandparents passed away. For many years, I was alone until I formed a bond with Lily, who was 11 years younger and worked at the shop, leading to our marriage. Despite our age difference, which often surprises people, she's very mature and a wonderful wife. With my marriage as a turning point and having always wanted to own my shop, I decided to become independent. It's a small shop, but I opened a pastry shop with a cafe. This shop, started by my wife and me, has a special focus. When I chose the location for the shop, by chance, which is placed on a street with kindergartens and nurseries. Initially, I planned to open a regular pastry shop, but choosing that location sparked a new inspiration in me. Let's make sweets that even kids find delicious. It's not uncommon for young children to have allergies to eggs or milk. Therefore, in addition to making regular cakes, I also created cakes and cookies without using eggs or milk. The items we sell include strawberry sponge cakes, chocolate cakes, tarts, roll cakes, and cookies. This selection is limited and simple, but having egg-free and milk-free options quickly spread by word of mouth and we became known as a delicious cake shop where children could also enjoy treats. Many parents and their children stop by after picking up their kids from kindergarten or nursery. On occasion, we are requested to provide birthday cakes that do not contain eggs or milk. As a little service, we also have individually wrapped cookies at the register for kids to pick and take home with them. I'm glad we set up shop here. The bright smiles of the children always give me energy. Having my own shop, a family to protect, and living a normal life was something I could never have imagined back then. Reflecting on those times, I couldn't have pictured this, but I want to cherish the happiness I feel now as I live each day. One day, my mother-in-law asked me for a favor. On a day when the shop was closed, she wanted help cleaning up her childhood home which had been left untouched for many years. Since her parents had passed away, the house had been left as is, but now she planned to sell the land. Before handing it over to the real estate agent, she wanted to clean up the inside of the house. On a day when both our days off coincided, the three of us went to her childhood home. But there, something astonishing happened. I found myself stopping in my tracks in front of the garden. The familiar garden, a lone doghouse, and as I matched it with my memories, I found myself inside the house. On a small shelf, there was a photo of a dog and the name Buddy. I might have been here when I was a kid, I muttered. When I murmured that, both of them tilted their heads and went, huh? That's when I shared my past experiences. 
After hearing the whole story, she, with her hand over her mouth, said, That story is true, isn't it? No way, I couldn't believe it. And started recalling her memories. Turns out, my mother-in-law was a kind lady from my childhood. She is currently a preschool principal, and it seems that her decision to pursue this career was influenced by me. Back then, the lady didn't have children, but after I was taken in by my grandparents, she became pregnant. During her parenting years, she often thought of me. Originally a child care worker, she always wondered if there was something she could do for children like me. So, when her child-rearing days calmed down, she built a small-scale children's center on the land she inherited from her parents, offering not just daycare but also support for families in need. Because I met you, I'm now a principal, she said. If that's the case, I said, and then I told her. The reason I run a pastry shop today is all because of the homemade cookies you gave me. Being able to chase my dream and marry Lily is all thanks to your kindness. Thanks to you, I became a decent man. Hearing this, both Lily and her mother burst into laughter, perhaps finding it funny that I called myself decent. I had no idea that I had met her a long time ago. But how come neither of you recognized each other? Lily asked, puzzled. Immediately, she responded, well, it was a story from over 30 years ago, but really, it's strange. Even though you got married and lived so close, I never realized. We both changed too much to recognize each other, and we all laughed together at the absurdity. One day, with a serious expression, my wife said, I have something to discuss with you. Curious, I asked what was on her mind. I've been thinking if there's something I can do too. She shared her thoughts. Hearing about how her mother and I met, Lily wanted to do something for the community and the children as well. She had volunteered during her student days and had always wanted to contribute in some way when she could. She proposed an idea, suggesting we work on it together if it wouldn't be too much trouble. I agreed to her proposal. A few times a year, holidays and our shop's regular days off coincide. We decided to start a family baking workshop during these days. Since the shop was too small, we used the children's center. The plan involves enjoying the decoration of cakes and cookies without using any fire. I want to continue innovating within our capabilities, but I also plan to keep going as we have been. My wife and I share the sentiment. Here's to seeing even more sparkling smiles from parents and children in the future. Do you think you've become some kind of superhero? Emerging from the shadows, Chris sneered as he looked down on us, flustered. Beside me, Sherry, surrounded by five gang members, was trembling in fear. The leader of gang encircling Sherry and me was Trevor. Breathing heavily, Trevor was loudly laying down the law. However, the moment he heard my name, Trevor suddenly changed his demeanor. Confused by Trevor's unexpected reaction, Chris raised his voice, attempting to incite an attack on us. But irritated by Chris, Trevor turned his back on us and glared at Chris, who was arrogantly standing behind. Unaware of my relationship with Trevor, Chris must have thought he could use the gang to harass me. And because of this, Chris, who had overstepped his bounds, ended up cornering himself into a dire situation. My name is David. This year, at 36, I have a somewhat unusual background. During my student years, convinced I had no allies, I clashed with others daily. Though sometimes mocked for my height, no one could match up to me, the strongest. Of course, I've had some trouble with the law. Only the police officer, Kevin, genuinely worried about me. You need to be kinder to people now that you're an adult. Kevin always looked out for me, calming me down whenever I caused trouble. It was Kevin who introduced me to the military, a path I had never considered during my uncertain future. After enlisting, 
confident in my physical abilities. I was recognized by my superiors and underwent special training and various experiences. Reevaluating my life, I worked hard to study, something I had never done before, hoping to be of some use to others. Years later, having risen to a position where I was in charge of a unit, I was assigned to a special forces team. Longing for a normal life after completing numerous missions, I retired from the special forces and took a job at a regular company. The company I joined was a small foreign trade firm, dealing directly with international transactions and mainly mediating between companies. Occasionally, I have to deal with individuals who can show their faces in broad daylight, which is why Mr. Thompson, president of my company, knowing my background, hired me also as a bodyguard. Never a fan of formalities, I found the daily routine of wearing a suit and working on a computer all suited to me. Yet, this mundane daily life felt fulfilling in its own way. I had no complaints about my job, except for one unbearable aspect. It was Chris, my younger, taller boss. Boasting about his prestigious university degree, he looked down on me as a high school graduate from the lower ranks. Chris's attitude was infuriating. Hey, you're a high school grad, right? It's amazing you got into this company, and at your age, it must have been your first job, huh? Must have been living a worthless life until now, right? Indeed, I am a high school graduate. But having served in the military and special forces, I pride myself on a rich life experience that is unmatched. Enduring Chris's endless and impressive college tales is an unbearable torment. Not going to college definitely means you've missed out on life, but I guess someone who's only experienced the bottom of the barrel like you can't even imagine that. I couldn't accept that such a worthless man was managing a team as a boss. Sherry, my direct supervisor and the senior manager, always laughed off Chris's pompous behavior and irritation towards me. Don't worry about it. We just need to do our job. Feeling a familiar kindness in Sherry, I was surprised to find she was the daughter of my mentor, Kevin. While talking about Kevin, Chris, looking displeased, slammed my desk hard. Having fun with my Sherry, even though you're just a high school grad, you are 10 years too early for that. An irritated Chris dumped a mountain of work on me and left. Then, Sherry looked at me worriedly. Is this okay? It's a lot, but compared to the operations in the special forces, this is nothing. Handling paperwork is not a big deal. However, having spent over a decade in the isolated world of special forces, I lack the manners and rules of a civilian. Without Sherry's support, I couldn't even properly set up meetings for outside sales. Sherry, though higher in position, is much younger in age. Her gestures of gently calming me, so obviously reminiscent of a parent-child relationship, felt nostalgically familiar. And every time Sherry joined me on outside visits, Chris would glare at me with jealous rage, grinding his teeth. It was obvious to anyone who saw it. Chris had set his sights on Sherry. Indeed, Sherry, with her beautiful looks and bright personality, was well regarded by the staff and an incredibly attractive woman. Sherry, uncomfortable with his advances, tried to keep her distance, but Chris, undeterred, would seize any opportunity to approach her and invite it. Sherry, I found a great place. Let's go out for dinner, just the two of us tonight. Unable to bear it any longer, I grabbed Chris's hand as he attempted to touch a distressed Sherry. Ouch, what are you doing? Can't you see Sherry is troubled? And lately, touching a woman without consent is a big issue, isn't it? Do you even know who you are talking to? Unlike bottom ring employees like you, I'm a manager. Chris boasted arrogantly, as if his position as a manager justified his behavior. To me, it didn't matter what position he held. Sherry was the daughter of my mentor, and if she was in trouble, it was only right to help her. Chris tried to shake off my hand and landed a strong punch to my stomach, 
but such an attack hardly made an impact on my trained body. I feigned pain to appease him, and Chris sneered at me triumphantly. Humph, I'll let it go for today. Just don't ever get in the way of me and Sherry. He left in a good mood that time. But to protect Sherry, I continued to interfere with Chris's tyranny time and again. Then, one day, I was suddenly summoned by the department head, Alex. It seemed Chris had been feeding Alex all sorts of stories. Although I couldn't agree with being reprimanded, I kept apologizing. Unlike Sherry, who came to console me after the lecture, Chris came to gloat. After all, a useless person like you is just dead weight to the company. Just quit already. Causing trouble here would only burden Sherry and Mr. Thompson, who had hired me. As much as I wanted to retaliate, I had no choice but to let Chris's insults slide. However, as I continued to intervene to keep Chris away from Sherry, my desk began to pile up with work he dumped on me daily. The volume of work kept increasing over time, and soon I was buried in so much busy work that I couldn't even make the last train home, let alone leave on time. I'm making a useful employee out of a bottom rung like you, be grateful. Sherry, worried about me, offered her help, but before we knew it, it was past midnight. Seeing the time, Sherry suddenly smiled at me. It's too late now, can't be helped. Let's grab some dinner and then take a taxi home. I couldn't refuse Sherry's invitation, nor could I let her go home alone. All right, as a thank you for helping me with the work, dinner is on me tonight. Sherry's childlike expression of joy, a stark contrast to her usual beauty, felt incredibly endearing. The pleasant time flew by quickly, and I left Sherry in front of the restaurant to look for a taxi on the main street. Just as a taxi pulled up, I heard Sherry scream. Rushing back, I found Sherry surrounded by five large men. What are you guys doing? We'll deal with the guy later. Miss, would you come with us? As I brushed off the man's hand that was grabbing Sherry, he glared at me with a demonic expression. Hey, who do you think you are? Don't you know me? I'm Trevor, the gang leader around here. The gang Trevor claimed to be a part of was one that Mr. Thompson had warned me about. And Trevor was their young leader. His large build and sharp eyes would make any ordinary person want to flee immediately. But no matter who the opponent was, I couldn't back down. It doesn't matter who you are. If you lay a hand on her, I won't hold back. Facing Trevor's ire, his fist flew towards me with resolve. I thought I could handle the attack, but it was tough to bear after several hits. Seizing a moment's gap, I grabbed Sherry's hand, attempting to escape from the situation. But there were five of them. They weren't going to let us escape that easily. Cut off from any escape, I was deflecting the attacks from Trevor and his gang when a familiar voice echoed from the shadows of a building. What are you doing? Hurry up and finish him off. Emerging from hiding was none other than Chris. Standing before us, Chris arrogantly started spouting selfish remarks. Hey, you think you're some kind of hero. You're no match for Trevor and his crew. Stay away from my sherry. Chris, convinced of his absolute superiority, looked down on me with a smug grin. Facing five opponents, I had no way out, and even I couldn't protect Sherry under these circumstances. Sherry, paralyzed with fear, trembled and couldn't move. In this dire situation, I racked my brain for a solution but came up empty, falling right into Chris's trap. However, upon closer inspection, Trevor's face looked familiar. Wondering if it could be him, I introduced myself. Could you be, Trevor? I am Trevor. What do you mean by could you be? Do you think you'll be allowed to act like that? Irritated by my words, Trevor frowned and glared at me condescendingly. Do you recognize me? I'm David. Right after I introduced myself, Trevor's eyes widened and his face turned pale. Then, in a panic, Trevor started apologizing profusely, despite being in the middle of the road. 
Wait, you're David. I'm terribly sorry for my ignorance and disrespect. Hey, you all apologize too, now. Shaken by Trevor's sudden erratic behavior, the rest of the group hastily apologized to me. Sherry, stunned by Trevor's bizarre actions, managed to stop trembling from the shock. And above Chris's astonished face floated numerous question marks. David, what on earth are you? Dumbfounded by Trevor's repeated apologies, Sherry looked back and forth between me and Trevor. Losing patience with Trevor and his crew's inexplicable fear, Chris started yelling and berating them. Trevor, what are you doing? Hurry up and teach this guy a lesson. Shut up. Do you even know who this man is? David here used to lead the gang that ran this area, and I owe him a lot. Someone like you has no right to speak lightly of him. Before meeting Kevin, I used to vent my frustrations and cause trouble, and that's when I met Trevor. Trevor suddenly came to me, who was undefeated at the time, wanting to be my disciple. Initially reluctant, I eventually started taking care of Trevor, who would always follow me around. This odd relationship with Trevor somewhat changed something in me. I never expected to reunite in such a manner. Trevor kept apologizing to me. Confused by Trevor's turnabout, Chris still ordered them to attack me and Sherry. Who cares about the past? You said you'd listen to me, so do it now. Despite Chris's harsh words, Trevor defiantly glared back at him. Unable to comprehend Trevor's actions, Chris looked flustered, absent-mindedly scratching his head. Suddenly stopping, he pulled something from his jacket's inner pocket. Holding something shiny and sharp, Chris screamed and lunged at me. Easily dodging Chris's attack, I grabbed his hand and knocked the dangerous object to the ground. What are you even doing? Stay away from my sherry. Trevor, you are useless to me. Enraged and turning red, Chris hurled insults at Trevor and his crew. But Trevor and his crew remained unfazed by Chris's words. Letting go of his arm, Chris stumbled and fell to the ground. Getting up while grimacing, Chris glared at me fiercely. Remember this, you'll pay for defying me, the manager. Looking around in panic, Chris continued to loudly insult me and Trevor's crew. Then, holding his arm in pain, he fled the scene. Sherry, having witnessed everything, looked at me with a face that couldn't hide her astonishment. I didn't want Sherry to know, but in this situation, I had no choice but to explain. Taking a deep breath, I slowly shared my past with Sherry. Truth be told, I didn't always live a life I could be proud of in the past. It was during such times that I met your father. As I shared the story of how I met Kevin, Sherry's face lit up with understanding and relief. Confused by her unexpected reaction, Sherry began to speak with a joyful smile. So it was you. I heard stories from my father, and I'm glad to see you're just as kind and straightforward as I imagined. It seems Sherry had heard about me directly from Kevin himself. Despite the trouble I had caused, learning that Kevin had spoken fondly of me made me feel somewhat bashful. As Sherry and I shared this indescribable moment, Trevor approached apologetically. David, I truly apologize for today. You've become a fine adult. Different from before, I'm impressed all over again. Trevor's subordinates, confused by his reaction, kept their distance, watching the situation unfold. They must be wary of me, now a mysterious figure to whom Trevor has apologized. David, let me make it up to you by driving you home, and please, miss, join us as well. Gratefully accepting Trevor's offer, I got into the car he guided us to. As I relaxed, thinking this was a moment to catch my breath, Sherry looked at me with sparkling eyes. David, I don't know the details, but you were in some incredible places, weren't you? Do you have amazing muscles or something? Even after retiring, I haven't skipped my daily training routines. With a body fat percentage of 5%, my physique, maintained through consistent training and exercise, even after my special forces days is indeed extraordinary. 
Sherry's fascination with muscles seemed to erase any fear she had from being attacked earlier. Though the conversation took an unexpected turn, I was relieved to see Sherry's spirits lifted. After ensuring Sherry's safe return home, Trevor also drove me to my place. As we were about to part ways, Trevor stepped out of the car to speak to me. David, if there's anything I can do for you, just let me know. And about that, Chris, it seems he holds quite a grudge against you. The information Trevor shared about Chris was astonishing. But now, I had proof that Chris couldn't boast about being a manager anymore. The next day, I was greeted by a visibly irate Chris as I arrived at work. Immediately upon seeing me, he grabbed my suit and looked down at me with a glare. Chris began to boast about his past, as if trying to intimidate me. Yesterday was just a mistake, right? I mean, I was part of a bad gang back in high school. There's no way I'd be scared of someone like you. It seems Chris met Trevor through a senior's introduction during their college years, but from the way Chris refers to him, they don't seem to be on equal footing. More likely, Chris was somewhat of an underling to Trevor. Despite this, Chris boasts about having Trevor as his protector, looking down on me with a complacent smile. Fed up with Chris's attitude, I shrugged off his grip and made a call, leaving my phone on speaker. Trevor, are you available right now? Yes, always happy to hear from you, David. Chris, taken aback by Trevor's unusual tone, froze with wide eyes. He hadn't expected me to call Trevor. Ignoring the stint, Chris, I continued the conversation about what happened yesterday. That was all true, right? Yes, Chris was the one who paid us to attack you and your friends. His reckless behavior, pretending to be a gang leader, has been quite a nuisance. Chris, panicked by Trevor's statement, tried to end the call immediately, but several employees had already arrived at the office. He found himself under the cold, disdainful gazes of those around him. This is a lie. I don't know anything about this. David must be forcing him to say these things. As Trevor continued to expose Chris's actions, Chris turned pale, covered his ears, and collapsed to his knees. Trevor was furious at being called a liar, and he berated Chris over the phone. Upon hearing the commotion, Mr. Thompson appeared, after learning of Chris's misdeeds from nearby employees, Mr. Thompson sighed deeply and looked at Chris with disdain. Chris, is this true? Well, this is, um... As Chris tried to mumble an excuse, Mr. Thompson pressed him for an answer. Resigned, Chris, his face gone from pale to white, apologized to Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson, looking weary, addressed Chris who was barely able to voice his apology. You're apologizing to the wrong person, aren't you? That's, I understand. David, I'm sorry. Chris, seemingly still not fully convinced he should apologize to me, swallowed his pride and offered an apology. Not only did Chris's scheme fall through, but he was also stripped of his managerial position on the spot by Mr. Thompson. Moreover, surprisingly, Chris was demoted all the way down to a regular employee, possibly due to Mr. Thompson's decisive action. Days after the apology incident, Chris, having finally realized his unwarranted behavior, completely stopped his unreasonable demands and arrogant attitude towards his juniors. However, for some reason, whenever Chris caught my eye, he would stop, back away, and flee. It was rare for Chris to initiate a conversation but that day, he approached me with a nervous yet somehow smug expression, reminiscent of the old times. David, you're a high school graduate, right? Can you speak French? It seemed Chris had received a call from a client I was in charge of, who could only communicate in French. Chris probably assumed that, because I was a high school graduate, I wouldn't be able to handle communication or consultations in French. However, Thanks to my diligent studies before joining the Special Forces, I could easily speak French, so there was no issue. After smoothly concluding the discussion with the client, 
The surrounding employees looked at me with admiration, leaving Chris dumbfounded. Speaking French was nothing out of the ordinary for someone with my special forces background, but it seemed to have taken everyone else by surprise. Isn't this normal? No, did I do something strange again? For me, who had spent a significant amount of time abroad, such skills were to be expected. Apparently, Chris, who had always boasted about his education and acted superior, was known among the employees as an incompetent college graduate due to his lack of French proficiency. Indeed, Chris's attempt at speaking French over the phone was barely coherent. I managed to understand only that he desperately wanted me to take over the call. As my reputation significantly improved, Chris, once a manager and a college graduate, was now labeled useless, drawing disappointed looks. Employees who had once been looked down upon by Chris now chuckled at his complete loss of dignity. Humiliated, Chris returned to his desk, holding his head in his hands. From then on, cases requiring French communication were almost always directed to me. Although it happened occasionally, Chris would revert to his arrogant behavior towards juniors only when I wasn't around. However, no employee would listen to the commands of the inept former manager who couldn't speak French, and not a single person entertained Chris's demands or unreasonable requests anymore. One day, upon returning from an external visit, I caught Chris and successfully hitting on a new female employee. This, this isn't what it looks like, she insisted, and I had no choice, it's not my fault. Chris's excuses sounded nothing more than childish whining. Deeming his words unworthy of response, I whispered to him. I'm still in touch with Trevor, that's why there haven't been any recent troubles with that group. Trevor and his subordinates have been keeping an eye on you, Chris. Chris collapsed on the spot, shaking slightly as he stared off into the distance, all strength drained from his body. Afterward, Chris stopped his arrogant behavior and, occasionally, was even seen praising others. He must have changed his heart and reformed his ways. Still, he continues to glance my way, gauging my reactions. Every time our eyes meet, his face contorts and he breaks into a cold sweat. Years have passed since I started working at this company, and although Sherry has since married and left, I was promoted to manager. And now, Chris is the chief. He has completely changed his ways and become considerate of those around him. Chris has become a dependable member of my team. Having met Kevin and seeing people like Chris come to realize their mistakes, I've grown to believe that the world could be a better place if more people did the same. Having witnessed the darker side of humanity during my time in the Special Forces, my modest dream is for human conflicts to cease. It might seem naive for someone my age, but Kevin and Sherry always took my fanciful ideas seriously. I continue to maintain a friendly relationship with Kevin's family. While I may not be capable of much, if I can change even a few people's perspectives from looking down on others, I'll have made good use of my experiences.